it's me, Julian Greystoke, here again with another book review. I have been actually having really good luck with indie books lately. In fact, if you're interested, I have a whole in December wrap-up you can go check out where I read three indie books over the month of December, technically four, although one I started well before December. But anyway, I have been having really good luck with indie books, and so I was excited to read another one. This is one I had my eye on for a while, and I finally decided to go ahead and use up an Audible credit and get it, because you guys know that I mostly listen to books these days. This is Kinshu. She's here because she heard I was wearing a black shirt, and I needed some of her hair on it. Kinshu, you can't... you're standing on my notebook. Please. I at least need to look at my notes, okay? Carry on, then. And just as quickly as she came, she left. Alright. I am easily abandoned. I'm gonna be looking on Goodreads for the synopsis of this book. That book is Songs of Autumn, which, as I said, I had my eye on for a while. What if your entire life you knew the exact day you were going to die? Liz does. Magic, in, spelled with a CK. I don't know why, but when I see magic spelled with a CK, I'm like, oh ho ho, we're being pretentious now, aren't we? Magic in the Kingdom of Aegis, I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced, I don't actually remember, has almost run out. When that happens, the seasons will stop changing, the tides will cease to turn, and the sun will no longer be able to rise and set. The only way to save the lives of her people is if Liz agrees to be the blood sacrifice in a brutal ceremony that will take her life. Can I pause here for a moment already? I knew reading the book that the seasons would stop changing, but... The book did not do a good job of making it clear all of the things that were gonna happen when magic went away. Like, I don't remember anyone talking about the fact that the sun wouldn't rise and set anymore, which seems like a bigger problem than the seasons not changing. But the seasons part is what the book really focuses on. The problem is, Liz isn't ready to go. With the help of a mischievous wannabe soldier, I think it's pronounced Matioc? Steel. Liz dares to take her fate into her own hands, de defying a bloodthirsty sorcerer. Her desperate flight teaches her how to truly live, while Matt finds out what's worth dying for. Each other. Love, death, magic, and mystery come together to weave one girl's epic tale of self-discovery. Her song will echo within us all. There's no mystery. That's also a lie. So that synopsis does make the book sound pretty intense. And boy, was I ready to enjoy it. And boy, was I let down. I'm sorry I was let down. Before I dive into the review, I did want to say that I knew that Lauren was also an author tuber, but I hadn't really checked out uh, any of her author tubing before I read the book. I just kind of wanted to go in completely blind. Uh, and, but since I, I just popped over to her channel and I was looking around and I'm like, this channel looks super fucking fun and I'm definitely going to be binging some of these videos later. And then I noticed that she only has 304 subscribers and I'm like, what the hell? Why are we all sleeping on Lauren? So definitely go check out her YouTube channel. It looks super fun. I'm 100% going to be watching a bunch of videos later. But now back to the review. I hate to say it of another, like, smaller indie book. The main character, Liz, has a very serious case of special girl syndrome. If only a cure could be found, because she is the very specialist of special girls. And I'm not just talking about the fact that there's a prophecy that says killing her will save the kingdom. Like, she has all of the tropey hallmarks of this special girl. For example, she has special girl hair. She has, she's like one of the only people in the whole world with red hair and it's curly. And we are constantly reminded of her beautiful red curly special girl hair. I feel like the author lacks some confidence in her writing. I have heard that maybe this is one of her first like bigger projects. I'm not sure. And so she does this thing and I do it too when I'm getting better. At least I hope and catching it in myself. Rather than showing or telling, she does both, just to make sure you got it. So she will show first, have two characters acting like enemies, and you, the reader, are going, okay, very clear, she showed us how they are. And then she'll just say, they hated each other. And you're like, 
you showed it clearly. And I think this can come from a lack of confidence, where an author just doesn't believe that they have gotten across what they intended to get across, so they better tell you, just in case, that you didn't get that these two are rivals. I actually do the opposite. What I tend to do is I, I write like, this is a, an exaggeration, but I'll write like, she was angry, and then I'll show you how she was angry. And then when I edit, I have to go back in and get rid of that first part because I'm going I'm to show you. So I do it the reverse of how this author does it, but it's a problem for both of us. And she, unfortunately, has not really been able to eliminate it. It is constant. Let me just say that Liz and Tia, Liz being the main character and Tia being her maidservant, have the most chemistry of any two characters in this book. Liz and Tia should be endgame. Fuck that Matt guy. Why is he even here? He has zero chemistry with her. But let's actually just dive right into that as well. You may have seen, if you've read any reviews of this book, people talking about insta-love. And I was like, okay, I know how insta-love usually goes in books. I'm pretty braced for it. I was not braced for the level of insta-love that we got in this book. Like, just immediate. So they're immediately attracted to each other. You, there's this, like, token, like, ten minutes where they're snarking back and forth and they don't like each other. But literally halfway through the book, they're like, I would die for him. I would die for her. And there's no grounds for it. We're given nothing. The only thing that I have to hope for is that possibly there's some magic involved. If I was going to read the second book, which unfortunately I'm not, I'm hoping that later it's revealed that they're just like impossible, insatiable love for one another is because of the prophecy or magic happening. Because if you read between the lines, it does seem like that's a possibility. Instantly, completely dedicated to one another and just so freaking in love with nothing to earn it. I find the love interest Matt, who is the archetypal peasant with a heart of gold and also dark secrets that will later be revealed kind of guy. He has soul pain and I, I hate him. <laughs> I hate him. At first it was like, okay, like at the very beginning of the book, I was like, all right, guy's a bit of a tool, but I can get over it. But he, he gets worse and worse and worse, and I just, nope. And he's a point of view character, so you can bet I was just not engaged with his sections of the book at all. Along with the love being rushed, all character connections were rushed. Except for the one between the main character and Tia, because they were already friends. But we are meant to believe that the main character goes out literally lucks her way into this group of, like, peasants who are on her side for reasons, and she supposedly, we are told, that she forms these bonds with them. And then we're supposed to believe that these people are ride or die for her. So unless in the next book they betray her for her being, like, too naive and believing that everyone was on her side, again, the author is doing that thing where she does not earn the relationships. She doesn't earn the romance relationship and she doesn't earn any of the other relationships either. We're just told that they happen, don't ask questions, these people are just very loyal to her for some reason. And trust us when we say that she spent time with each and every one of them and she totally bonded with all of them and she learned this, this, and this from them. Would you like to see some of that happening? Well, too bad. The world building in this book is so, so, so shallow. And again, I feel weird saying that from somebody who's not queen of writing world building myself, especially with the blurb building the world up to be so interesting. It seems like we've got a world that's going to be trapped on the cusp of a deadly winter that will last forever. I should be able to feel this world, to feel the cold, to get an idea of the atmosphere of dread about this winter that will be here forever. Everyone is talking about how when the first snow comes, that's it. But the world could just be generic fantasy world number eight. There's nothing about it that felt real or visceral. The author gave us like nothing. She kind of forgot to use all of our senses and to really immerse us in this world. The characters do a ton of camping and they barely ever complain about being cold. The only time she gets cold is when she literally throws herself into a like half frozen river. Can we get some atmosphere? Can we hear the leaves crunching? Can we smell the leaves? 
Can we get the, the fear of the people knowing that like this is their last harvest ever? The world lacks any kind of flavor. I know some people will be excited to hear that there is the one bed, two people trope in this. I know it's a very popular trope, but it feels so unearned. And it's because everything is rushed. This book is rushed. Some people say in their reviews that it's a snappy read, but I wouldn't call it snappy. I would call it rushed. Everything is glossed over. Let's go, 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 go. Nothing important is held on. Speaking of special girl hair, like I was a while ago, you probably remember. One thing that annoys me in books when characters have special girl hair is their refusal to hide it in any way besides, I'll put on a hood. She doesn't even consider cutting her hair, which would be thing one. She tries to like dye it in the beginning with mud or something, but everybody immediately figures it out because it comes right off. So, and then she stops trying to hide it at all, even though it totally reveals her as the sacrificial princess. And I just hate it when girls in stories have special girl hair, and then they don't even put in the minimum effort to hide it, even though it is something that will totally endanger them. Again, I talk about down here, for a book that deals so much with seasons and the natural world, it feels blank. Most of the time, it could be almost any season. The bad guy in this book is called the Dragon, and he's supposed to be this absolutely terrifying, ominous bad guy. But we don't even see him until at least halfway through the book, and he's never menacing. He never felt scary to me. We needed to see some of the villages that he had burned. We needed to see some of the devastation that he could wreak, instead of just being told that he could do it, instead of just being told he's a scary bad guy coming to get our main girl. There's also a really weird thing in this book. There's another race of people, like mostly there's humans, but then there's also these like half-bloods or whatever they were called. They look like humans, but their blood is black and they like still have magic and they're kind of like mutants or something. And we see them a couple times at the beginning of the book and then like never again. The guy character has an interaction with them where I think we're supposed to believe that he's really diplomatic and treats them differently than anyone has ever treated them, but A, I don't have a good handle on why they're treated badly in the first place. B, I didn't believe that he was actually doing all that great with them. And C, what is the point of them in the first place? They don't, they, they vanish and they like don't come up. I have a feeling maybe they're going to be more in the next book, but they needed to be more in this book. Again, the, the super thin world building on display here. Why? How? What's the deal with them? Why are they second class citizens? Why do they still have magic? Are they mutated from humans? No answers. This is Makes It Easy, the book. I hate it when books do this, when everything is just easy. Suddenly, this escaped princess who is supposed to die to save the world has no trouble raising an army. Everyone is just super loyal to her. Don't ask questions. And then the book ended in a cliffhanger, which in no way makes me interested to read the next book. This book was underwritten. It was very underwritten. You, the author needed to go back in and put in some key scenes instead of just telling us that she's earning the loyalty of these people we needed to see it instead of just telling us that the villain is big and bad and scary we needed to see it before the villain actually gets to attacking our main characters we need to see why it would be bad if he attacked our main characters we need to see the love develop i mean Whatever, if you don't want to have a slow burn, that's fine, but this love was so fast. Breakneck speed. I got whiplash from how fast this insta-love happened. In my opinion, this is just my opinion, if I wrote this, I would be like, I'm going to put this on the back burner, I'm going to write some other stuff, practice, get better, because if this is her heart book, this is her the book of her heart, she needs to do some other stuff and get better at all of these skills and then come back to this book. I think there's too much missing from this book that good betas and good editors aren't going to be able to put in that she needs to realize and go back and put in and fill it out with what it needs. Now that's just my opinion and you guys know, I've talked about this before, I critique other people, but I'm not a perfect author myself. I'm not the god of writing. So you can feel free to take or leave what I have to say here. But that's just the vibe that I personally got from this book, is that it needs 
an overhaul. There was nothing so horrible it was book breaking. There was nothing so bad that it would be like throw the book away and stop trying now. But it just needed a lot more work. So those are my thoughts on this book. Disappointing. I was so disappointed. I wanted to love it. The premise sounded so cool. I think it could be, if it was taken down and reworked, I think it could be something really cool. But it also has a lot of five-star reviews, so don't take my word for it. Go check it out if you're interested. As I was mentioning before, I am also an indie author. You can check out my book, The Wolf and the Hawk, and judge it as harshly as you like. It's available now on Amazon. Only thing is, if you're gonna judge it harshly, I do ask that you read it first. None of that, just giving it one star without reading it business, come on. I post brand new videos here at least twice a week, and if you want even more content from me, then you can hop on over to my Patreon, where for as little as a dollar a month, you can get exclusive access to content not seen here on the regular channel. You can also find all the links to my social media down in the doobly-doo for ease of your clicking, including my Goodreads where I am much more like up-to-date on all of the books that I have read. So if you want to see my thoughts about them right away, check out my Goodreads. I think that's all I have to say in my outro. Gosh, I'm starting to forget my own outro. I've only done this eight million times. I have a lot of videos here on this channel. I guess that's something I often say. If you liked this review, I have a whole bunch more, all in a handy playlist for you. So go check them out. Roam the channel to your heart's content. And I will see all of you again next time with whatever it is I happen to be doing next time. Bye! Oh, hello! What brings you here to the end of the video? Is it patrons? I bet it's patrons. Patrons like Very Bad Books, Anna, Belle, Patrick, Anne Sophie, Callison, Ray, Artemis, Shelby, Zaire, Jesper, Irene, Scribbling Cat, Savvy, Jenny, Amanda, Lisa, and Sarah. Why well, I can't think of a better reason that you would come to the end of this video. My patrons are awesome. Here we come to turning of the season. Witness to the ark towards the sun. The neighbor's blessed burden within reason Becomes a burden born of all in one And nobody, nobody knows